John Wayne also called, Duke, whose real name was Marion Robert Morrison was born May 26, 1907 in Winterset, Iowa, but grew up in Southern California. He lost a football scholarship to the University of Southern California as a result of a body surfing accident, and began working for the Fox Film Corporation. He appeared mostly in small parts in serial westerns but his first leading role came in Raoul Walsh's western, The Big Trail, in 1930, an early widescreen film epic which was a box office failure. John Wayne played leading roles in numerous B-movies during the 1930s, most of them also westerns without becoming a major name. It was John Ford's Stagecoach, in 1939 that made John Wayne a mainstream star and became a popular icon through his starring roles in films made during Hollywood's golden age, especially in Western and war movies. His career flourished from the silent era of the 1920s through the American New Wave, as he appeared in 142 major motion pictures, and in 37 television productions. He was among the top box office draws for three decades, and he appeared with many other important Hollywood stars of his era. John Wayne's father, Clyde Leonard Morrison, 1884-1937, was the son of American Civil War veteran Marion Mitchell Morrison, 1845-1915. Wayne's mother, the former Mary Molly Alberta Brown, 1885-1970, was from Lancaster County, Nebraska. Wayne had Scottish, English and Irish ancestry. His great-great-grandfather Robert Morrison left County Antrim. Ireland with his mother arriving in New York in 1799 eventually settling in Adams County, Ohio. The Morrisons were originally from the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides, Scotland. John Wayne was raised Presbyterian. Wayne's family moved to Palmdale, California, and then in 1916 to Glendale where his father worked as a pharmacist. He attended Glendale Union High School where he performed well in both sports and academics. Wayne was part of his high school's football team and its debating team. He was also the president of the Latin Society and contributed to the school's newspaper sports column. A local fireman at the station on his route to school in Glendale started calling him, Little Duke, because he never went anywhere without his huge Airedale Terrier, Duke. Wayne preferred, Duke, to, Marion, and the nickname stuck. Wayne attended Wilson Middle School in Glendale. He played football for the 1924 league champion Glendale High School team. Wayne applied to the U.S. Naval Academy, but was not accepted. Instead, he attended the University of Southern California, majoring in pre-law. He was a member of the Trojan Knights and Sigma Chi fraternities. Wayne also played on the USC football team under coach Howard Jones. A broken collarbone injury curtailed his athletic career. Wayne later noted that he was too terrified of Jones' reaction to reveal the actual cause of his injury, which was due to a body surfing accident. He lost his athletic scholarship, and without funds, had to leave the university and began to work for the Fox Film Corporation. As a favor to Coach Jones, who had given silent Western film star Tom Mix tickets to USC games, director John Ford and Mix hired Wayne as a prop boy and extra. Wayne later credited his walk, talk, and persona to his acquaintance with Wyatt Earp, who was good friends with Tom Mix. Wayne soon moved to bit parts, establishing a longtime friendship with director John Ford who provided most of those roles. Early in this period he had a minor, uncredited role as a guard in the 1926 film, Bardelli's The Magnificent. Wayne also appeared with his USC teammates playing football in Brown of Harvard, in 1926, The Dropkick, in 1927, Salute, in 1929 and Columbia's, Maker of Men, filmed in 1930 and released in 1931. While working for Fox Film Corporation in bit roles, Wayne was given on-screen credit as, Duke Morrison, only once, in, Words and Music, in 1929. Director Raoul Walsh saw him moving studio furniture while working as a prop boy and cast him in his first starring role in The Big Trail in 1930. For his screen name, Walsh suggested Anthony Wayne, after Revolutionary War General, Mad Anthony Wayne. 
Fox Studios chief Winfield Sheehan rejected it as sounding too Italian. Walsh then suggested, John Wayne. Sheehan agreed, and the name was set. Wayne was not even present for the discussion. His pay was raised to $105 a week. The Big Trail was to be the first big-budget outdoor spectacle of the sound era, made at a then-staggering cost of over $2 million, using hundreds of extras and wide vistas of the American Southwest, still largely unpopulated at the time. To take advantage of the breathtaking scenery, it was filmed in two versions, a standard 35mm version and another in the new 70mm grandeur film process, using an innovative camera and lenses. Many in the audience who saw it in 70mm grandeur stood and cheered. However only a handful of theaters were equipped to show the film in its widescreen process, and the effort was largely wasted. The film was considered a huge box office flop at the time, but came to be highly regarded by modern critics. After the commercial failure of The Big Trail, John Wayne was relegated to small roles in a pictures. He played the lead, with his name over the title, in many low-budget poverty row westerns, mostly at monogram pictures and serials for Mascot Pictures Corporation. By Wayne's own estimation, he appeared in about 80 of these horse operas from 1930 to 1939. He was mentored by stuntmen in writing and other western skills, and developed and perfected stunts and on-screen fisticuffs techniques which are still in use. One of the main innovations Wayne is credited with in these early Poverty Row westerns is allowing the good guys to fight as convincingly as the bad guys, by not always making them fight clean. Wayne claimed, Before I came along it was standard practice that the hero must always fight clean. The heavy was allowed to hit the hero in the head with a chair or throw a kerosene lamp at him or kick him in the stomach, but the hero could only knock the villain down politely and then wait until he rose. I changed all that. I threw chairs and lamps. I fought hard and I fought dirty. I fought to win. John Wayne's second breakthrough role came with John Ford's Stagecoach in 1939. Because of Wayne's B-movie status and track record in low-budget westerns throughout the 1930s, Ford had difficulty getting financing for what was to be an A-budget film. After rejection by all the major studios, Ford struck a deal with independent producer Walter Wanger in which Claire Trevor, a much bigger star at the time, received top billing. Stagecoach was a huge critical and financial success, and Wayne became a mainstream star. Ford at the time said that John Wayne would become the biggest star ever because of his appeal as the archetypal, everyman. America's entry into World War II resulted in a deluge of support for the war effort from all sectors of society, and Hollywood was no exception. Wayne was exempted from service due to his age, 34 at the time of Pearl Harbor, and family status, classified as 3A, family deferment. Wayne repeatedly wrote to John Ford saying he wanted to enlist, on one occasion inquiring whether he could get into Ford's military unit. Wayne did not attempt to prevent his reclassification as 1A, draft eligible, but Republic Studios was emphatically resistant to losing him since he was their only a list actor under contract. Herbert J. Yates, president of Republic, threatened Wayne with a lawsuit if he walked away from his contract, and Republic Pictures intervened in the selective service process, requesting Wayne's further deferment. U.S. National Archives records indicate that Wayne, in fact, did make an application to serve in the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, precursor to the modern CIA, and had been accepted within the U.S. Army's allotted billet to the OSS William J. Donovan, OSS commander, wrote Wayne a letter informing him of his acceptance into the field photographic unit, but the letter went to his estranged wife Josephine's home. She never told him about it. Wayne toured U.S. bases and hospitals in the South Pacific for three months in 1943 and 1944 with the USO during this trip. He carried out a request from Donovan to assess whether General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the Southwest Pacific Area, or his staff were hindering the work of the OSS Donovan later issued John Wayne an OSS Certificate of Service to memorialize Wayne's contribution to the OSS mission. By many accounts, his failure to serve in the military later became the most painful part of his life. 
His widow later suggested that his patriotism in later decades sprang from guilt, writing, he would become a super patriot for the rest of his life trying to atone for staying home. John Wayne's first color film was Shepherd of the Hills in 1941, in which he co-starred with his longtime friend Harry Carey. The following year, he appeared in his only film directed by Cecil B. DeMille, the Technicolor epic, Reap the Wild Wind, in 1942, in which he co-starred with Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard. It was one of the rare times he played a character with questionable values. Director Robert Rossin offered the starring role in All the King's Men in 1949 to John Wayne but he refused, believing the script to be un-American. Broderick Crawford, who was eventually cast in the role, won the 1949 Oscar for Best Male Actor, ironically beating out Wayne, who had been nominated for Sands of Iwo Jima. In 1950 John Wayne lost the leading role of Jimmy Ringo in The Gunfighter to Gregory Peck due to his refusal to work for Columbia Pictures because its chief, Harry Cohn, had mistreated him years before when he was a young contract player. Cohn had bought the project for Wayne, but Wayne's grudge was too deep, and Cohn sold the script to 20th Century Fox, which cast Gregory Peck in the role Wayne badly wanted but for which he refused to bend. Batjack. The production company co-founded by Wayne in 1952, was named after the fictional shipping company Batjack in Wake of the Red Witch, a 1948 film based on the novel by Garland Rourke. A spelling error by Wayne's secretary was allowed to stand, accounting for the variation. Batjack, and its predecessor, Wayne Fellows Productions, was the arm through which Wayne produced many films for himself and other stars. Its best-known non-Wayne productions were in 1956, Seven Men From Now, which started the classic collaboration between director Bud Bodicher and star Randolph Scott, and Gun the Man Down, with contract player James Arness of Gunsmoke fame as an outlaw. One of Wayne's most popular roles was in The High and the Mighty, in 1954, directed by William Wellman, and based on a novel by Ernest K. Gann. His portrayal of a heroic co-pilot won widespread acclaim. Wayne also portrayed aviators in Flying Tigers in 1942, Flying Leathernecks in 1951, Island in the Sky in 1953, The Wings of Eagles, and Jet Pilot in 1957. He appeared in nearly two dozen of John Ford's films over 20 years, including She Wore a Yellow Ribbon in 1949, the Quiet Man, in 1952, The Wings of Eagles in 1957. The first movie in which he called someone, Pilgrim, Ford's, The Searchers, in 1956, with Natalie Wood is often considered to be John Wayne's finest and most complex performance. Howard Hawks's Rio Bravo, premiered on March 18, 1959. In it Wayne plays the lead in an ensemble that consists of Angie Dickinson, Dean Martin, Ricky Nelson, Walter Brennan, and Ward Vaughn. John Ford's The Horse Soldiers had its world premiere in Shreveport, Louisiana on June 18. Set during the American Civil War, Wayne shares the lead with William Holden. In 1960, John Wayne directed and produced The Alamo. He was nominated as the producer of Best Picture. That year Wayne also acted in Henry Hathaway's North to Alaska with Ricky Nelson. In 1961, Wayne acted in Michael Curtis's The Comancheros. On May 23, 1962, John Wayne acted in John Ford's The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance with James Stewart and Lee Marvin. On May 29, premiered Howard Hawks's Hatari. On October 4, The Longest Day started its theatrical run, where Wayne acted among an ensemble cast. On February 20, 1963, Wayne acted in one of the segments in How the West Was Won. On June 12, Wayne played the lead in his final John Ford film named Donovan's Reef. On November 13, another film starring John Wayne premiered, Andrew V. McClaglin's McClintock. In 1964, Wayne acted in Henry Hathaway's Circus World. On February 15, 1965, John Wayne played the role of a Roman centurion in George Stevens's The Greatest Story Ever Told. 
On April 6, Wayne shared top billing with Kirk Douglas and Patricia Neal in Otto Preminger's In Harm's Way. On June 13, he acted in Henry Hathaway's The Sons of Katie Elder. In 1966, Wayne acted in Melville Shavelson's Cast a Giant Shadow. On May 24, 1967, Wayne acted in Burt Kennedy's The War Wagon with Kirk Douglas. His second movie that year, Howard Hawks's El Dorado with Robert Mitchum premiered on June 7. In 1968, Wayne co-directed with Ray Kellogg, The Green Berets the only major film made during the Vietnam War in support of the war. John Wayne wanted to make this movie because at that time Hollywood had little interest in making movies about the Vietnam War. Also that year, Wayne acted in Andrew V. McLaglen's Hellfighters. On June 13, 1969, Henry Hathaway's True Grit premiered. For his role John Wayne won Best Actor at the Academy Awards. In November of that year another film starring Wayne was released, Andrew V. McLaglen's The Undefeated, co-starring Rock Hudson. On June 24, 1970 Andrew V. McLaglen's Chisholm started to play in cinemas. Wayne takes the role of the owner of a cattle ranch, who finds out that a businessman, played by Forrest Tucker, is trying to own neighboring land illegally. On September 16, 1970 Howard Hawks, Rio Lobo, premiered. Wayne plays Colonel Cord McNally who confronts Confederate soldiers who stole a shipment of gold at the end of the Civil War. On June 1971, George Sherman's Big Jake made its debut co-starring Maureen O'Hara. In it Wayne plays the role of estranged father who must track down a gang who kidnapped his grandson led by Richard Boone. In 1972, Wayne acted in Mark Rydell's The Cowboys. Vincent Canby of the New York Times, who did not particularly care for the film, wrote, John Wayne is, of course, marvelously indestructible, and he has become an almost perfect father figure. On February 7, 1973, Burt Kennedy's The Train Robbers opened. In it Wayne acts alongside Anne Margaret and Rod Taylor. On June 27, Andrew V. McLaglen's Cahill U.S. Marshall premiered. In it Wayne acts alongside George Kennedy and Gary Grimes. In 1974 Wayne took on the role of the eponymous detective in John Sturgis's crime drama, MCQ. On March 25, 1975, Douglas Hickox's Brannigan premiered. In it Wayne played a Chicago police lieutenant named Jim Brannigan on the hunt of an organized crime leader. On October 17, 1975, Rooster Cogburn, co-starring Katherine Hepburn, started its theatrical run. In it Wayne reprised his role as U.S. Marshal Reuben J. Rooster Cogburn. In 1976, Wayne acted in Don Siegel's The Shootist. It was Wayne's final cinematic role, whose main character, J.B. Books, was dying of cancer, which Wayne himself succumbed to three years later. Upon its theatrical release, The Shootist grossed $13,406,138 domestically. It was named one of the 10 best films of 1976 by the National Board of Review. Film critic Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times ranked the Shootist, number 10 on his list of the 10 best films of 1976. The film was nominated for an Oscar, a Golden Globe, a BAFTA Film Award, and a Writers Guild of America Award. The film was nominated by the American Film Institute as one of the best Western films in 2008. Although John Wayne enrolled in a cancer vaccine study in an attempt to ward off the disease, he died of stomach cancer on June 11, 1979 at the UCLA Medical Center. He was buried in the Pacific View Memorial Park Cemetery in Corona del Mar, Newport Beach. According to his son Patrick and his grandson Matthew Munoz, who was a priest in the California Diocese of Orange, Wayne converted to Roman Catholicism shortly before his death. Wayne requested that his tombstone read, Fio, Fuerte y Formal a Spanish epitaph he described as meaning, ugly, strong, and dignified. His grave, which was unmarked for 20 years, has been marked since 1999 with the quotation, Tomorrow is the most important thing in life.
comes into us at midnight very clean. It's perfect when it arrives and it puts itself in our hands. It hopes we've learned something from yesterday. In 1999, the American Film Institute selected John Wayne as one of the greatest male stars of classic American cinema. He made his last public appearance at the Academy Awards ceremony on April 9, 1979 before succumbing to stomach cancer two months later. He was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor of the United States. John, Duke, Wayne, Hollywood's greatest Western hero and American icon.